anyone can learn a move, right? Yeah. Like when you're walking, you can lift up that knee and point that toe. You know, make it sassy. Yes, like sassy. Sassy. Lexi's got sass. Lexi's all sass. This is Kristen Ann Ware. Sassy. I'm whipping it. Sassy. She knew joining the Miami Dolphins meant having the perfect hair, body, and smile. But she wasn't prepared for what else she'd have to face. They say you're only special in the uniform. Your opinion doesn't matter. Your voice doesn't matter. You're here to perform and that's it. They intimidate you into silence. But, I mean, you want to be a cheerleader. It's the best job in the world. Cheerleading, an iconic American pastime. Some love it. Others think it's an image-obsessed, second-rate sport. It's a topic far removed from my day-to-day as Refinery29 senior beauty editor. But growing up as a soccer player, they were always on the periphery. What I looked like on the field never mattered. But I'm here today to learn how in cheerleading, it can mean the difference of whether or not you make the team. So there's a big difference in this. It's pretty. Sideline Prep is a pro cheer consulting company, and Janine Samuels is its leader. Right? So, thank you. Teaching the tricks of the trade from her 11-year run as a professional cheerleader. What's most important, definitely nutrition and fitness, Mm -hmm. and then just don't sleep on the importance of your appearance. But when did appearance become so important to pro cheer? Cheerleading in the early 1900s was a male-only activity at elite Ivy League schools. During World War II, women took over when men left to fight, stepping it up with gymnastics and acrobatics. It was in the 1970s that Dallas Cowboys owner Tex Schramm saw a lucrative opportunity to boost ticket sales by making cheerleading all about sex appeal. Skin-tight outfits, suggestive dance moves, and a beauty queen look became a must. Today, professional cheer is as much about image as it is about dance. For these women, it's all part of the game. Here we go, tear it up. Just as important as putting in long hours at the gym and mastering moves. We work so hard for years just for one audition. It's about the experience, it's about the sisterhood. I love the glam. I love the feeling of putting on my makeup and getting my hair done and going to go dance and seeing myself in the mirror. I just love it. Here we go. From their moves to their makeup, every last detail is considered. Whatever it takes to land a coveted spot on a team of their dreams. Women want to become professional cheerleaders to basically extend their life of a passion that they already have professional level is the next step for them. Yay! That looks so good! But recent headlines are shining new light onto this dream, revealing just how vulnerable it is to exploitation. A new lawsuit against the Raiders. Two Raiderettes say they were humiliated and groped. They're not even paid for quite a bit of the work that they do. An entire reform on how professional cheerleaders are treated is long overdue. She and her lawyer are calling on the NFL to do more to protect cheerleaders. Kristen Ann Ware is currently filing a claim against the NFL and her former Miami Dolphins cheer team for discrimination based on her gender and religious beliefs. She says that once her team discovered her vow to wait for marriage, her coaches started singling her out and attacking her. It all came to a head in her third season interview. Usually the interviews, they talk about your dance technique, you know, how you are on choreography, what they expect of you, things like that. And nothing of my job was talked about during that interview. And I went in and I sat down and the first thing the director mentioned was, let's talk about your vow to wait for marriage. And I was, I don't know, I remember the feeling of sitting there, kind of like my palms start to sweat, you know, like your kneecaps start to shake, your heart's pounding, because something in me told me, like, this isn't right. What happened after your interview? 
they asked me to change into a bikini to see if I was calendar ready, which was usual. Like, it, it was never a problem before. But just the fact that I felt like I was attacked for something so personal and so valuable to me, and to then have to change into a bikini and stand in front of them, I mean, it took a piece of me. And I remember looking in the mirror and just saying, Kristen, you can leave. You can walk out right now. And I didn't. Kristen Ann was used to being critiqued on her appearance. It was part of the job. For her, what crossed the line was feeling disrespected and degraded. And she's not alone. This kind of treatment is pervasive across the country. Bailey Davis, a former New Orleans sensation, says she was kicked off the team for an Instagram photo deemed too sexy. Members of the 2013 Washington Redskins cheer team reported being forced to pose topless at a photo shoot while male sponsors watched. And former Houston Texans cheerleader Gabriella Davis alleges that she and her teammates were called crack whores and jelly bellies. I have not spoken to a cheerleader, not one, where they didn't tell me that they were told all the time that they are not special, that they are just a girl in a uniform, and there's a million girls that would take their place. Sarah Blackwell is a lawyer representing Kristen Ann, along with several other former pro cheerleaders who are taking on the NFL. It sounds to me like they just want to completely control them. They have a lot of control over these women, and the way they get it is by belittling them and making them feel worthless. You are told that you are only here to be seen and never heard. Your opinion doesn't matter, your voice doesn't matter. You're completely replaceable. Why would they say things like that? I think it's the ownership and the control that they want to have over you. Not only when you're in the uniform and you're at your job, but when you're away from it. Sarah gave me access to some of the cheerleaders' handbooks and rules. I saw guidelines for everything. Love life, social media, and appearance. The rules for dealing with players reveal a clear double standard. Cheerleaders are told to avoid players at all costs. But the players are free to do what they want. This is extreme gender discrimination. And the players can go anywhere they want. They can text the cheerleaders. They can call the cheerleaders. They can follow the cheerleaders on social media. But if the cheerleaders even accept their request, they can be immediately terminated. They say it's for the girls' protection, which is sad because we're not in the 1950s here. Perhaps the best indicator of how they're valued is how much they're paid. I used to be a Cincinnati Bengal but I was paid more being a dancing cupcake than an NFL cheerleader. <laughs> it didn't take long for Alexa Brenneman, now Westendorf, a two-season NFL cheerleader for the Cincinnati Bengals, to realize she was being taken advantage of. You're expected to pay for your nails, you're expected to pay for your hair, you're going to have to have a gym membership, stay in shape, but we were paid around $100 per game. I added up our practices, our trainings, our appearances, our events, and then divided those hours, and it's less than $3 an hour. Alexa filed a lawsuit against the Cincinnati Bengals, and in 2015, the team finally agreed to back pay and to raise salaries to meet minimum wage. As these lawsuits come about, women are starting to be paid minimum wage, and things are starting to change. Alexa's case shows that it's possible to take on the NFL and win. Still, there's a long way to go. Today, what cheerleaders are paid is less than the players, and in many cases, less than the mascots, less than the concession stand workers. I was curious to know what Janine Samuels, as a professional cheer veteran, thought of everything I'd learned. A lot of cheerleaders that we've spoken to have said one of the things that kept them quiet was this idea of, you're easily replaceable. I could have a girl in here tomorrow. The concept of feeling as though you are easily replaceable um, is valid, I think, for pro cheer. It's also valid as a reporter, as an anchor, 
but I think that it's less of a fear and just part of reality. And I would hope that women don't allow that reality to hinder them speaking up and voicing concerns or problems that they may encounter. Cheerleading has been my life. As a child, it was my outlet. We're in it because we love it, because we're dancers and we love the sisterhood. There are so many younger girls that look up to me. I just want to set the tone for them and show them that this is an attainable dream for them. While some have used the lawsuits as part of a bigger argument to end pro cheerleading, the women leading the charge see an opportunity for something else, a chance to be included in the conversation. I'm just speaking out to make a positive difference for the NFL, not to bash the NFL. What it's going to take is a team of women that are going to stand up together and say, we're not going to tolerate this any longer. What do you hope happens with the NFL? They, they need to say, I hear you to the cheerleaders, and that we're going to take effective and real steps to make this a very professional and lawful environment. And if their voices are heard, it could transform the sport into something that's truly worth cheering for. Thanks for watching Refinery29. For more videos like this, click here. And to subscribe, click here.